This is the story of a great aircraft engineer, a man who built the engines which powered the fastest, most advanced planes of their time, from Spitfire to Concorde. But his finest hour came 40 years ago. I think my greatest success was the two-stage uh, supercharger on the Merlin. That I did do myself. And I proposed it, I, I, I specified it, I did all the calculations, we made it, and it worked first pop. It puts 70 miles now on the speed of the Spitfire and 10,000 feet on its fighting altitude. Uh, yeah, Marshal Broderick flew the first one and always tells me about how he soared up past an FW-190. And I could see the German pilot following me up like that with a look of utter astonishment on his face. So, uh, without any doubt, I think the uh, two-stage Merlin, which was my first con real contribution to aviation, was my best. Stanley was showing by his supercharger technology how to stuff the air through the engine. And the Merlin power was increased from 1,000 horsepower at the beginning of the war to 2,000 at the end of the war. And by these means, the RAF was able to keep ahead of the Germans. If it hadn't been for that work, I don't think the RAF could have won the Battle of Britain. Stanley Hooker was born in 1907, the son of a Kent farm manager. He was quick to demonstrate a gift for physics and mathematics. By the age of 28, with degrees from Imperial College and Oxford, and in danger of becoming a professional student, he took a scientific job with the Admiralty. But his engineering career came about by chance. By the late 1930s, the great rearmament program was underway. Aircraft factories were being built across the country. There were thousands of jobs going on the new production lines, and bright young boffins were needed in the design departments. It was at this time that Stanley Hooker first met Ernest Hives, the formidable boss of Rolls-Royce's Derby factory. Well, it was in uh, January 1938, early in January 1938, and I remember on one of the usual miserable, cold, dark, damp days, you know, when I walked up uh, Nightingale Road in Derby to be interviewed by Lord Hives over there. <coughs> and I remember wondering what the hell I was doing there, because I had a very nice job in the scientific research department of the Admiralty at the time. And uh, I went into old Hive's office, and he had all my papers on this, on this very desk. This was the desk in question. And he's thumbing through these, because I had a degree in mathematics from London and a doctorate from Oxford, and I'd written quite a lot of theoretical papers on aerodynamics, primarily. And uh, he thumbed through all this lot, and he looked at me, and he said, you're not much of an engineer, are you? I said, no, I'm not. I had to admit that. He said, never mind. He said, we'll, we'll, you know, we can teach you to be an engineer. And um, he said, who do you work for? Who do you work for? And I said, well, I told him. And he picked up the phone and said to his secretary, get me Sir Charles Wright, it was at the time. And I thought, good God, you know, I hadn't told the Admiralty I was going there for a job or anything of that kind. And I thought, well, he's, you know, he's going to cut the ground from under my feet now. And he did, too. He rang this fellow up, and they had a conversation on the phone. And he put down, and he said, well, he says you're a dirty dog, because he's just promoted you. He said, but we can, he said, but, but we can have you if we want to. When I arrived, and they led me through this uh, hurricane of activity that went on in Rolls-Royce, telephones ringing, typewriters clapping, great big drawing boards, and all that sort of thing to a little office with glass partitioned office, you know, opened the door and there was an empty desk and a bookcase and a telephone and chair. And he said, this is your office, cheerio, and he left me. And of course, I sat there all day and did nothing. The next day, the same thing happened. The third day, I took the times in with me and took my pipe and started to smoke. The smoking was forbidden, except between half past 10 and 11 in those days. But I started to smoke in the morning, and people came around to morning. I knew that, you know, I thought, oh, yeah, well, you know, there's nothing else to do, so I went on smoking. And eventually I got, I got tired of this, and um, I went out of the office into the next office, where there were a lot of young men, all busy as hell with drawings and calculations and so forth. And over in the corner was a very quiet old boy, grey-haired, and sitting rather like this. It was after lunch, I think he was asleep, actually sitting like this, and I went over to him and I said, what do you do? And he said, oh, he said, I, I, I'm in charge of supercharger testing. So I said, what's that mean? Well, he said, well, you know, we, we put a supercharger on an electric motor rig and we test it and we measure the pressure and the airflow and all these characteristics. He said, and here's the results. And he showed me, I said, well, can I have one of those curves? And he said, oh, have the lot, like that. 
So I went away to my office with this bunch of data, which was meat to me because I'd been trained to handle the flow of air and pressures and temperatures and so forth. And I analysed all this lot and came to the conclusion that there's got to be certain changes made in the compressor if it was... Although I'd never seen one at that stage. I'd never seen a, uh, an aero engine close to or a, su or a supercharger. But one could deduce what the diffuser efficiency was, the rotor efficiency and so on. And I did this and I wrote a report. And uh, I didn't hear anything about it. And I passed it to the chief engineer who looked at it and said, oh, this is very interesting. I must pass this to Mr. Eller who was the chief experimental engineer. And about a week later, old Ella burst into my office. I was just going home. I should leave at five on the dock with nothing else to do. And he waved this thing at me. He said, did you write this? I said, yes. So I thought, good God, what's happening now? He said, well, you're in charge of superchargers. And that's how I got my first job. Well, the day after war was declared, a Monday, uh, was the usual day in which Hives held his great technical survey of the position of the Merlin engine principally at that time and I remember him coming in we, uh, to the meeting sitting down and looking at it all and saying now we're in this war and we've got to win it no good being a good second and uh, he immediately set about the the usual uh, agenda for the afternoon uh, of course Ro uh, Rolls-Royce were already set up by Hives to double their output overnight it meant, meant the men had got to work a lot harder, of course, but uh, the machine tools and the, and the materials and everything were there, ready for that. In fact, the men worked 18 hours a day for seven days a week when the war started, because every engine that fought in the Battle of Britain was actually made at the works of Derby. There was no other factory in the country producing Merlin engines at the time. The atmosphere at Derby in 1940 was intense because uh, the war was on, on the go, and the engines that we had in the Hurricane and Spitfire, the Rolls-Royce engines, were smaller than the German engines, and we therefore had to produce as much, if not more, power than the Germans from a smaller engine, and that meant a more high degree of development. And so we were able to advance the power of the Merlin all through the war, steadily, from 1,000 horsepower to 2,000 horsepower without basically changing the engine. It still went into the Lancasters and the Hurricanes and the Spitfires and the Mosquitoes. No basic change. Whereas the Germans had departed and built the Focke Wolf 190 with a great lumbering uh, air-cooled engine in it. Brute force and bloody ignorance, I called it at the time, I remember. And uh, we were all obsessed by the idea that we were going to keep them in ahead of the Germans. We did too. By the summer of 1940, the piston engine fighters were flying in the Battle of Britain. While on the ground, in a disused foundry, a top secret design was being developed Frank Whittle's jet engine. But his radical idea had few supporters. One of them was Stanley Hooker. And uh, I had several times tried to persuade old Hives to go and uh, see this engine. And he said to me, you know, what does it do? And I said, well, it gives a thousand pounds of thrust. He said, a thousand pounds of thrust? He said, what's the use of that? So that wouldn't pull the skin off a rice pudding, would it? Mount Hooker knew the power was there. He would prove to Hives that Frank Whittle's jet was worth investigating. And so on the Sunday, he picked me up in his car and we drove down and we saw Whittle's engine running. And old Hyde went round without any comment, very much comment, and Whittle was telling him all about the engine, the advantages and so forth. And at the end of it, he, old Hyde looked at Whittle and he said, I can't see many, many engines about here, Whittle. He said, where are they? Where are they all? And Frank Whittle said, well, I've only got two, you know. He, I can't, he said, I can't get the, the parts made. So old Hyde said to him, send us the drawings, we'll make bits for you. And we did. But the Ministry of Aircraft Production had already chosen the Rover Motor Car Company to make the early Whistle engines. By 1942, though, Rover's management and Whistle were barely speaking. Hooker heard about the conflict and told Hives, who began to plot. He wanted to make that remarkable jet engine. And he did. And one day old Hyde said to me, come on, we're going to have dinner with S.B. Wilkes, the chairman of Rover's, at Clitheroe tonight. So away I went, went with him, I didn't know what was going to happen. We had a nice dinner, a five bob one, but being Yorkshire, you can get a bit over the odds, you know. 
And we had a very nice... And then, uh, when dinner was over, old Hives turned to Welsh and said, Now look, he said, Welsh, what are you doing with this jet engine? He said, I hear you aren't getting on with this chap Whittle. And old uh, Wilt said, No, we're finding him very difficult. So Hive said, Well, you shouldn't be doing that engine, should you? You're not an aero engine company. You grub about on the ground, I remember him saying. And uh, he said, I'll tell you what I'll do. He said, I'll give you a tank engine factory at Nottingham. You give me this jet job up here. And old Will said, done. I should be jolly glad to be shot of the job. And that's how we got Barnoldswick and the development and uh, we became responsible for the production of uh, jet engines. And we were mostly young men. Even, uh, even um, Stanley Hooker himself would only be 35 or 6 at that time, and he was the boss. I myself was 30. We had a, a complete um, carte blanche to do almost what we wanted with regard to modifi modifying the engines. If we thought up some new way of constructing it that could be done without too much manufacturing, we used to get the tests done overnight, and we could test them in the, in the next day. Uh, if it required manufacturing, we had all the resources of Rolls-Royce uh, to call on to get casting, sheet metal work, and that sort of thing. And so we could do quite uh, advanced things in a matter of weeks. Few believed the jet would be powerful enough, but Hooker and his team proved the doubt is wrong when the Meteor jet became the first plane fast enough to shoot down a flying bomb in 1944. We went on developing the engine and um, then we, we were told by the ministry to, to design an engine of 4,000 pounds of thrust, uh, which was a big step up, twice the thrust. And uh, I went to, was sent to America about that time, because we had great collaborations with the Americans. We told them everything we were doing. And they even had a Whittle engine. He gave them an engine. And to my horror, when I got there, I found they were already running an engine at 4,000 pounds of thrust, or close to, the General Electric Company were. And so when I came back, I said, to hell with this 4,000, let's design it for five. And we rang up, I remember ringing up the ministry, George Watt, it was group captain George Watt who was in charge. And I said, look, George, we're forgetting 4,000, we're going for 5,000. And he said, OK. And that was all we had to do in those days. Now it would take a year to get a, get a thing agreed like that. We started it in January 1945, we had it running by the middle of the year, and we took the world speed record in October the same year. It was the first aeroplane ever to exceed 600 miles an hour, the Meteor. We were improving rapidly a, a new breed of engine. I don't, we be also began to see that it would revolutionize air transport altogether, not just as a fighter engine, but in, tr in transport aircraft and everything. And I would have thought that, um, that um, Stanley Hooker was one of the first people to see that this would be so. The Rolls-Royce workshops at Derby have been producing air record-breaking engines for almost 20 years. It is here that the famous Derwent jet engines are made. Engines that can hurl a plane through space at a speed where the normal smooth flow of air breaks down into a series of violent shock waves. But a shock wave of the personal sort lay ahead for Hooker. One of his projects, the Avon, went wrong, and he quarreled with his mentor, Hives. He said, um, there's too much hanging on the fate of this Avon engine for me to leave it up here in this damn garage. He said, this isn't Rolls-Royce, you know, he called it a garage. This isn't Rolls-Royce. Rolls-Royce is at Derby, I'm going to take it there. And uh, I said, what are you going to do with me then? He said, well, he said, I think I'm going to send you home for three months. So I said, well, that's a fine return for 11 years hard work with you. I remember saying that to him. He said, I don't care about that. He said, you go home. He said, where are you going? I said, um, I don't know. He said, what's your address? I said, well, I'm not going to tell you. He said, well, how can I get in touch with you? And I said, well, you can't get in touch with me. I said, if you want to get in touch with me, you ring my bank. bank. I said, but I'll tell you one thing. If you send me home, I'll never work in a factory controlled by you again. And so we parted like that at Barnoldswick. Uh, and I must say, it was a very miserable and traumatic day for me. The Rolls-Royce uh, gas turbine team at Barnoldswick under Hooker had been enormously successful, of course, and one thought of Hooker as 
after Whittle as the most important gas turbine engineer in England, probably in the world. And uh, when the Avon got into that serious trouble and brought back to Derby, it was a bit of a shock to us that Hooker was given a comparatively uh, small job. Hives had persuaded Hooker to return and head Derby's research team. But the new job fell lamentably short of what Hooker had expected. Hives had always promised me, he had promised me that I should be chief engineer at Rolls Royce, you know. And by this time I was about 40 and I thought it was time I was made chief engineer at Rolls Royce. Not like today where, you know, at 50 you're a promising young engineer in Rolls Royce. But in those days, I, thought, oh, I was in charge of the turbine job when I was about 30, and uh, by the time I came to 40, I thought I was ready to take over the whole damn firm. But Hooker resigned instead. The Bristol Aeroplane Company was expanding into jet production and badly needed Hooker's expertise. Bristol had run into serious problems with the engine design of their new passenger plane, the Britannia. If they didn't get it right, and quickly, the company would collapse. Hooker's first job was to redesign the troublesome turboprop engine. I, it, was a, it was a time when I felt responsibility very heavily because I felt I was the only man in the company who had any real experience of uh, uh, jet engines. In the engine school, Dr. Stanley Hooker, the chief engineer, talks to flight crews from the Royal Air Force, Royal Canadian Air Force, and the Canadian Pacific Airlines. And so it is to the turbine engine over here that we have to turn for the lift of the car. These are the basic casings of the engine, opened up for your inspection. And over here we have the inside components which really produce the power. Hooker ran Bristol's engine team in the exhilarating years when the government spent freely on new fighter and bomber projects. When the mighty Vulcan, the Flying Dart, needed an engine, Hooker was determined to make one more powerful than anything his old Rolls-Royce colleagues could achieve. I remember sending out a Christmas card. Uh, we were very proud of this engine. It was the most powerful engine in the world at the time. Very proud of it. And we had a picture of Mount Olympus on one side, and Olympus, uh, Mount Olympus, 9,750 feet. Picture of the Olympus engine on the other side, Olympus engine, 9,750 pounds of thrust, you see. I sent this out, and I sent it to some of my pals in Rolls-Royce. One of them sent them, wrote back to me and said, how does the weight compare? <laughs> in 1958, the most expensive ever aircraft was ordered, TSR-2, designed around the successful Olympus engine, the world's first strike and reconnaissance plane. The Air Ministry demanded constant changes. Frustration mounted on both sides as delays and wrangling blew costs up to an all-time high. I remember saying to Geoffrey Tuttle when he was vice chief of the air staff, when they demanded a thousand miles uh, of uh, radius of operation for the TSR-2, I met Geoffrey Tuttle one day on an airfield, and I said, Geoffrey, why a thousand miles? I said, it sounds like a number just conjured out of the air. He said, it is. He said, it's an objective, you know, a thousand miles. I said, well, that will mean, that will cost you a million pounds a mile uh, uh, for the last 150 miles will cost you a million pounds a mile. And that was an underestimate, I guess, too. Within a few years, the TSR-2 had made its first flight and was regarded as a fighter of brilliant performance. Then, in 1965, with stunning suddenness, it was scrapped. There was old Sands white paper in 1958 which said, we're finished with man-piloted man aircraft. We're going to have missiles. Press the button. No more men. So men were out. Then the Americans cancelled the missile, missile, which was it, Blue Streak or something. Yeah, they cancelled that. So we had no missiles, and no manned aircraft. Old Thornycroft arrived on the scene, or Lord Thornycroft arrived on the scene rather, and uh, he said, well, I haven't got any aeroplanes, I haven't got any missiles on the stock, I'll order some more aeroplanes. So he ordered the supersonic vertical takeoff aeroplane, uh, an Armstrong Siddeley aeroplane, and TSR-2, etc. Old Healy came along, so manned aeroplanes were back in again. Old Healy came along and said, we can't afford all that lot. We'll buy F-111s on tick. So manned, aer manned aeroplanes red again. So in a period of a few years, we were in, we were out, we were in, we were out. You know, it was more like a boat race than a policy to follow. 
Hooker's highest hope for the Olympus now rode with a supersonic airliner, Concorde. But it took 18 years development with constant threats of cancellation before Concorde made its first scheduled flight in 1976. <laughs> Through those years of controversy, first over TSR-2, then Concorde, Hooker had been quietly developing another extraordinary aircraft engine for the first vertical takeoff fighter, the Jump Jet Harrier. We, we had this engine, but of course there was no aeroplane anywhere on the, on the stops that I knew of to take it. And uh, I must say we didn't push it all that much either because I wasn't really absolutely convinced that it wasn't a funny, you know, myself. Uh, and we were very heavily involved in TSR2 at the time. So that, uh, but I got a letter from Sydney Cam which said, Dear Hooker, what are you doing about uh, vertical takeoff? Yours, Sydney. Sydney Cam was the chief designer of Hawkers. They'd made all the RAF fighters from way back in the 1930s. The Hart, the Fury, the Demon, etc., etc., the Hunter, the Hurricane. And so I sent him a copy of our project brochure for the Pegasus, you see? And then forgot about that too. And a few weeks later, the telephone rang, and it was Sydney on the other end, and of course he was a very irate character, or could be, or made out to be. He said, when are you going to see me, Hooker? He said, so I said, well, I'll come any time. So Sydney, what's the subject? He said, the subject, he said, I've got an aeroplane round your engine. I said, which engine? He said, the vertical take engine, you fool, you know. So, I said, so, of course, up I went, and there I saw a picture of the P-1127, which is just like the Harrier, and there was the Pegasus engine installed in it. I said to Sydney, when, when we first put the engine, I suppose you're going to do some conventional flying, because the aeroplane could be used conventionally. All you do, had to do was point the nozzles back, and it was just a normal aeroplane. I suppose you're going to do some conventional flying first, Sydney. He said, what for? I said, well, you know, just to make sure the aeroplane's a nice aeroplane and everything under control. All oh, right, he said, the Hawker aeroplanes are always beautiful. He said, there's nothing wrong with the Hawker aeroplane. I'm not going to bother with that. It's vertical first time. And they tethered it on the end of a piece of string, you know. And the result was that when it took off, it went like, like, you know, all over the place. And it was far, very, very difficult. <laughs> Harrier went on to become an international success. Hooker had believed in it from the beginning. His support never wavered. It was his tenacity that kept the project alive. The world, Derby, America, the rest of the world, have spent a mint of money trying to make a VTOL fighter, and not one of them has succeeded. It's still the, the supreme solution as a VTOL fighter. The ultimate test of the Harrier's prowess came in the Falklands War, long after Stanley Hooker had retired. But without Stanley Hooker, there would have been no Pegasus engine and no Harrier. And without the jump jet, there would have been no Task Force victory. In 1967, Hooker retired to his country home near Bristol. By this time, his former employer, Rolls-Royce, had taken over the Bristol firm and was a main pillar of the British aircraft industry. But in 1971, the unthinkable happened. Rolls-Royce couldn't pay its bills. Edward Heath's government moved swiftly to prevent total collapse. They bought the company, except for the RB211 jet engine that had caused Rolls-Royce's downfall. So, Stanley Hooker was brought out of retirement as the one man who could convince the government that the RB211 was worth saving. The morale of the whole outfit, of the engineers particularly, had, you know, 
sunk to its lowest possible ebb. And there was a tendency to blame one another, you know. I think he ought to be sacked, and or he ought to be sacked, and so forth, you know. And also I found that uh, the first 11 wasn't necessarily working on the engine, which was a disaster. And so the first job I had to do was to, was to try to get more people, better people, working on the engine. Hooker was back at the helm, responsible for the success or failure of the RB211 program. He brought in his trusted colleagues from the old days. Among them, Harry Pearson. He had an enormous influence uh, on, on the position. Um, he put everybody's um, courage back, you know. They'd begun to lose heart. He restored that. And it was so typical of the man. He didn't find fault with anything. He just got down to it and made a, a wonderful engine of what was potentially a good engine anyway. I think if the RB211 had failed totally, it would be a terrible setback for British high-technology engineering. And Stanley came back from retirement. He took a grip of the engine and the engineers. He directed them, and he got it right. The, the motivating thing is to make a good engine, a powerful engine, you know, the best engine, reliable engine, not to kill anybody and so on. That's the motivating thing. And most, en most engineers bend their life to that task. The times had changed from Hooker's early days when it was the engineer whose word ruled. When he retired in 1978, accountants were in command. And we, we used to start an engine by saying, well, what's the engine got to do? You know, that much. Uh, how long does it take us to draw it? That much. How long it takes to make the first experimental engines? How much testing have we got to do? Um, when can they put it into production? And how much will it cost? So we start with, is it any damn good? That was number one question. No, it's the other way around. How much is the damn thing going to cost, you know? When do we put it in production? How many development engines are we going to have? How long is it going to take us to design it? The last question seems to be, is it any damn good? It's all gone round the other way. Well, Einstein was a great mathematician, a genius. I always thought that Stanley was a near genius. He was very, very clever and a very good engineer. And very clever, very good engineers um, are very difficult to find. You don't get too many in a generation or in a country.